I unmuted you, Jane. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, I, I had to get back to it. And it's like, oh, well. Hey, welcome everybody. So glad you're here today. Scott is a favorite of mine and he's a fluvial geophthalmologist. You know, I'd never heard that word before, Scott. <laughs> and he's president of McBain Associates. He spent most of his 30 plus year career focusing on improving river ecosystems downstream of dams. His experience has primarily been on restoring gravel bed rivers, assessing effects of low flows and high flows on aquatic and riparian habitat, river corridor restoration planning and channel restoration designs. His passion is to develop science-based solutions to river management challenges that mitigate or reverse the impact of dams and other land uses on downstream river ecosystems. Fire away, Scott, you'll enjoy all this. And he, by the way, he's going to pause periodically. You can put questions in chat, but he's going to pause periodically as he goes through the presentation and let you ask questions. Great. On, on it goes, Scott. Is it... Um... Can you see the screen okay? Everything's yep. good? Yeah, it's all okay. there. All right, great. Um, so thanks for the introduction, Jane, and thanks for the invitation, um, Ollie folks, and it's good to meet you. Um, and I see a few names in here that have been involved in this project well before me, so I'll um, defer to my uh, the forebearers to this project. I started working on this in 2017 on the behalf of the Round Valley Indian tribes, which are located on the upper Main Stem Eel River and on the Middle Fork Eel and um, on the North Fork Eel. Um, so fairly remote area, just north of Ukiah. And um, this project is owned by um, pg and &E, and they own a one dam or two dams up there. And this is a project where pg and &E is um, go, starting the process of decommissioning this project. So we're actually going to be re removing at least one dam and potentially two um, this is the only dam, uh, significant dam in the Eel River watershed. Um, so it's a pretty interesting project. I'm sure people have heard about the Klamath Dam removals. This one has less publicity, but this one will be coming in behind the Klamath Dam removal effort. So it's coming down the road. So a little bit of organization here. Um, I'll start off with the background of the Upper Eel River. I think most folks know where it's at in the Potter Valley project, but um, we'll go over that. Um, there's a lot of things that have happened here, and it was hard for me just to kind of say, I can't talk about everything, but what do I want to talk about? So I'm going to talk about three different technical things. Um, one is a process that we call the two basin solution um, that is trying to find a long term solution to this issue of the Potter Valley project um, between the Russian and the Eel River basins, and I'll explain that more. And then developing a decommissioning strategy that achieves the objectives of the two basin solution partners. Um, and then one piece of that will be looking at sediment management considerations in the reservoir itself. Sediment management is going to be a huge issue for this um, decommissioning process. And then I'll kind of give you an overview of kind of where we're at right now and next steps. Um, it's hard to do these kinds of projects without a huge list of acronyms. I've really tried to minimize these. Um, so probably just the two that I'll be using is PVP, which stands for Potter Valley Project, and then FERC is another one that gets used a lot, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They're the federal agency that regulates this project um, because the project is purpose is to generate power. It falls under their jurisdiction. So PVP and FERC, for the most part, I might mention NIMFs and Rand Valley Indian Tribes as well. So I'll try to keep that to a minimum. And... Um, what I'll do is at the end of each of these five sections, I'll stop and ask, spend a couple minutes with questions. Um, but otherwise, I'll try to blaze through each one of these um, before stopping. So let's start off with the background. So the Eel River is incredibly important to local communities and tribes on, for a number of different reasons. There's an adromous fish in the Eel River consisting of Pacific lamprey, steelhead, Chinook salmon, and it also provides water for agriculture in both the Eel and the Russian River basins. And these resource management needs, um, these are for both basins. Um, this project diverts water from the Eel River into the Russian River basin. So these um, resource management issues, including agriculture and fisheries, have an impact on both basins. It's not just an Eel River or a Russian River issue. So this is like really important stuff for us to try to manage for. 
The location of the Potter Valley project is in the upper Eel River Basin. Um, so the main stem Eel River comes up into here. So the project is right here. And just for geography, Ukiah is right here. And Eureka Arcata is way up in here. Um, the total watershed area for the Eel River Basin is very large watershed, 3,680 square miles at the, at the um, ocean. The watershed area on the, at the Potter Valley project is about 350 square miles. So it's way up there. Um, still quite a bit of watershed area, but a small fraction of the total watershed area. And everything else in the watershed is virtually unregulated um, from large uh, diversion in facilities. And the project is about 157 miles upstream from the ocean. So quite a ways up the river. So kind of zooming in on the project location, um, the Eel River is right here. And Scott Dam is right here, and Lake Pillsbury is the reservoir that forms behind it. And so Ukiah is down here in this le left corner. And how this project works is Scott Dam stores water in Lake Pillsbury, and then it releases water 11 miles down the Eel River down to Van Arsdale Reservoir and Cape Horn Dam, where there's a tunnel and a diversion facility that pushes water or gravity feed water through the hillside to a power plant um, in Potter Valley. And that water um, then goes into the East Branch Russian River, and then it also goes into Potter Valley Irrigation District canals for agricultural in Potter Valley project or in Potter Valley itself. Um, and then water that spills over Cape Horn Dam goes down the Eel River uh, down to the ocean, flowing north. So here's a picture of Scott Dam. So this is a major storage reservoir in the basin. It was completed in 1922. It's 130 feet tall. Um, the original storage was, I think, 86,000 acre feet or so, and it's a lot of it's filled in with sediment. So its current storage capacity is 76,800 acre feet. So what's an acre foot? An acre foot is if you had an acre of land and you put one foot of water on the top of it, which translates to about 326,000 gallons. And 326,000 gallon, gallons gives you, if you use 300 gallons a day in your house, it gives you a thousand days. So you can see that 76,000 acre feet of water is a lot of water when you put it in the perspective of how much water you use in your house each day. So quite a bit of water, um, not a huge dam, but um, quite a bit, um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, every drop is precious. And then look going downstream 11 miles to Cape Horn Dam and the diversion facility. This is a Cape Horn Dam right here. So it's lower elevation. It's only 65 feet tall. Um, the total drop on water surface is about 45 feet down. And there's some facilities here that are of interest here. Um, so first is the diversion that goes into the tunnel is just off this photo. It goes this way through the hillside into the Russian River Basin. Um, and that tunnel can convey about 300 cubic feet per second. Um, and then this is a fish ladder. So adults, salmonids, and lamprey um, so Chinook and Steelhead will come into the fish ladder, swim up the fish ladder up and over the dam, um, and go into the 11 miles um, of river upstream. But when you look at Scott Dam, there is no fish ladder. So fish cannot get upstream of Scott Dam. So that's a big problem that we're, um, that's the problem with this project. But there's a fish ladder at Cape Horn Dam. Um, this dam was the first part of the project that was completed way back in 1908. Um, it really doesn't have any storage because it's filled in with sediment. And so sediment actually routes through the dam or through the reservoir and spills over the dam um, and goes downstream. So there's a lot of issues with this facility um, because sediment is routing through the dam and large wood. When sediment, when we have high flows that come down here, sediment and wood will deposit in the fish ladder and bury the fish ladder and sediment. And because fish move in the wintertime when it gets buried, it uh, closes down the fish ladder. And then another thing is um, juvenile fish will have to go downstream um, as they out migrate out to the ocean. So when this reservoir is spilling, where do the fish go? They bounce down the face of this dam. So we have juveniles, steelhead and chinook that bounce down the face of this dam. And then we have steelhead that have already spawned and that are moving out to the ocean will also bounce down the face of this dam. So it's a Pretty poor facility for moving fish back and forth. So that's a big problem that we're trying to address. So how does the plumbing in this 
system work. This is just a schematic that shows Lake Pillsbury here, the stores water in the winter time and in the spring. And then the purpose of this project was to store winter flows in the reservoir. And then in the summertime, the spring and summer, release that water into Cape Horn Dam and Van Arsdale Reservoir and divert a large proportion of that water and generate power. Um, so that generates power in the Powder Valley Powerhouse. So this is in the Russian River Basin. And then they would divert water for irrigation in Potter Valley through PVID, or Potter Valley Irrigation District. And then surplus water would then go down the east branch of the Russian River and get stored into Lake Mendocino. And this excess water would be reused by water users in the Russian River Basin. So people really developed a dependency on this water since it had been flowing this direction from 1908. And water was then released down into the Eel River as well, down to the ocean. So power generation at the powerhouse, that was the primary official purpose of this project, but you know, a functional undeclared purpose of this is a water supply project into um, the, the Russian River Basin where it's used for agriculture and municipal uses. So that's kind of the plumbing of how that system works. And this is kind of another summary of that kind of concludes with the problem statement. So this project construction began in 1905. It's a very early project. It's now owned by the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, and I think they took it over in the 1930s or so. So they've owned it for a very long time. The primary purpose of the project is generate power, but it's only 9.2 megawatts, which is a very, very small generation of power. So it doesn't generate a whole lot of power, but it does divert quite a bit of water into the Russian River Basin from the Eel River Basin. But the primary reason of like, why are we taking out a dam? Don't we need dams to store water? Well, the reason that we're talking about taking this dam in is it doesn't generate a whole lot of power. The water is poorly monetized, so there's not really any income generated from the water diversion. And PG&E loses millions of dollars a year on this project. It's a total loser project financially, and they've been wanting to get out of this project for quite some time. So when their license came back up, they began the relicensing process in 2017. And then they went into the bankruptcy process and withdrew their license application to FERC in 2019. They put it up for sale on the market. Um, and not surprisingly, nobody wanted it um, because it was such a financial loser. So in July of 2020, they, 2022, they decided that they're going to surrender their license and decommission the project. Um, and decommissioning could include, could result in seizing water diversions over into the Russian River Basin. Those diversions are currently averaging about 60,000 acre feet per year. Historically, they were around 150,000 acre feet per year. So large amounts of water that was more or less free over into the Russian River Basin could end. So people that need that water in the Russian River Basin are very concerned about the loss of that water supply. And that water is not only used for agricultural uses in the Russian River, but also for fishery management uses over there as well. Um, and as we all probably know, salmon and steelhead are doing very poorly in both basins and lamprey. Um, so both basins are impacted by poor um, fish populations. So with dam removal, it would increase access to upstream habitats, upstream of Scott Dam, um, but it also could reduce the water supply to the Russian River Basin. So that's the thing that we're trying to balance here with this project. And so our Congressman, um, Jared Huffman, developed um, a two basin solution um, process, started that process to try to resolve this issue between the Russian River and the Eel River stakeholders because his congressional district encompasses both. So as you can imagine, he probably doesn't want a civil war going on in his, um, within his district. So he's looking for solutions here. So I'll stop there if there's any quick questions just about the um, kind of the geography and the quick background of the project. I have one on. question with respect to the um, financial issues. Why is it such a loser? Is it just because it doesn't generate the power and nobody wants the power or what happens? Yeah, so there's a number of different reasons, but one is it does it generate power and then the water itself is poorly monetized. They get a little bit of money from the Potter Valley Irrigation District for the water itself, but it's I think it's 15 or $16 an acre foot, which is pennies on the dollar on what it's worth. But the operational and maintenance costs of the 
project are very high as well as the environmental um, requirements to run the project. Um, and then the last thing I forgot to mention is that they've PG&E has kind of updated their seismic evaluation of the Scott Dam itself. And they are have found that it's not, there's a high seismic risk of that dam failing on a very large earthquake. And so one of the things that they just did this year is they stopped closing the dam, um, the gates on the dam. So it actually stores even less water now. So instead of 76,000 acre feet of storage, they're gonna leave the gates open. So now it only stores about 53,000 acre feet of water. So the amount of water that it can store is forever reduced substantially. And so that, that further reduces the value of the project. So basically the dam, Scott Dam has to come out. Thank you, Scott. There aren't any questions in the chat at the moment. Okay. All right. So um, I'll begin in the kind of the first, uh, the two basin solution strategy. Again, I mentioned that um, their Congressman Huffman kind of initiated this process. Can we find a path forward to improve fishery um, conditions on the Eel River while avoiding impacts to the Russian River Basin? So this is a, like a really hard question for us to answer. So he convened what was what we called an ad hoc committee in 2018 to investigate these. And as part of that ad hoc committee, we developed two technical subgroups that looked at um, uh, fish passage analysis, like how do we get fish into the upper basin and a water supply subgroup that looked at, is there a way to meet our water supply needs on the Russian River Basin um, it is it the same way? So we went through a process there, and I'm going to show you a part of that in a second. What sprung from that is a, um, after that is the two basin partnership members of Sonoma Water, Mendocino County, Inland Water and Power Commission, Humboldt County, Caltrout, and Round Valley Indian Tribes, so this group of five formed in 2019 as an out, offshoot of the ad hoc committee to do further studies and potentially look at taking over the project. And this two basin partnership focused on uh, feasibility studies for implementing this two basin solution to see if that if there was feasibility and could they take this over. And then they initiated a relicensing study plan process with FERC and then ended up pulling the plug on this um, at the end. And if you want any information on the ad hoc committee effort in 2018-19, there's a link here. And then the Two Basin Partnership, um, their website is right over here too. So if you wanna go to their websites and get more information, there's a bunch of reports there that you can look at in summary of what they've, what they've been working on. And the Two Basin Partnership is still sort of ongoing. Um, it's much less active right now though. And what I wanted to focus on um, today um, in our limited time is the water supply analysis because water rules everything in California. And then a couple of the um, kind of the fun technical analyses that was done for the feasibility study um, that was completed in November, 2021. So what are the shared objectives of the two basin partners? I won't read through this whole list. I just kind of highlighted the upper two that are kind of the most important but minimize or avoid adverse impacts to water supply, reliability, fisheries, water quality, and recreation to the Russian River and Eel River basins. So we we're really trying to focus on both basins. It wasn't one or the other. Um, and improve fish habitat and fish routing in the Eel River um, to support recovery of natural producing, self-sustaining, and harvestable native and adramus fish populations. So we really wanted substantial increases in fish populations, um, particularly on the Eel River Basin associated with this. We didn't want one or two more fish. We wanted substantial numbers for commercial uses, recreational uses, tribal uses, et cetera. So significant, not just um, a little bit. Good science, collaboration on funding, participation of tribes and stakeholders, economic welfare, both basins, continued hydro generation, um, tribal, cultural, economic, and other interests. So um, those are the kind of the governing objectives of the group. So one of the first things that we did was we looked at the water supply scenarios. So as a kind of a water operations um, engineer, um, this is something that I really enjoy. And keep in mind kind of the conceptual diagram of how water routes through the, um, the Potter Valley project. 
what we did was we kind of like stepped back and say, what are some of the things that we could do on the Russian River and Lake Mendocino side to improve water supply and storage, water storage? So it's kind of a matrix of um, potential solutions. And then on this axis over here is things that we could do on the on the Eel River Basin. So there's a couple different options here on the Eel River Basin and a couple different options here. So for example, we could increase the height of Lake Mendocino Co Coyote Valley Dam to increase storage. So that's an option. We could, you know, current operations on both as kind of a baseline existing condition. And then there's some other things that we could do, including like taking out the entirety of the Potter Valley project, which is going to reduce water supply to the Russian River. So the main thing is that we looked at a bunch of different options. We developed water supply modeling tools to evaluate these. But one of the scenarios that popped out of this is scenario two that actually showed some promise um, where we could take out Scott Dam, but do a different type of diversion pattern, this run of the river diversion pattern um, into the Russian River Basin to minimize impacts on the Eel River Basin and we think meet water supply needs on the Russian and, and Lake Mendocino side of things. So I want to kind of jump into this in a little bit more detail. So yeah, I have a question Sure. in the chat. Um, so Donna was asking, what would the Russian River Basin flow be without the 60,000 acre foot a year? In the summertime, it would be dry um, and particularly on drier years. And in the wintertime, they would just be normal runoff events from the watershed. So it's kind of at a, um, you know, the upper East Branch Eel River or Russian River um, would typically dry up in the drier years and it may have a trickle of water in the wetter years. So this is an artificially supported system. Like historically, they used to operate the project where, you know, the East Branch Russian River would be largely dry if the project wasn't there. And they used to divert up to 300 CFS in here. So it was a totally different system. Um, those diversions have been cut back over the years due to environmental regulations and license requirements, particularly back in 2006 with the latest license amendment. So it's kind of an artificial system on the Russian River side of things. It's a good question. So a couple of questions here on scenario two is like, okay, Lake Mendocino Fira, what the heck is that? Um, that stands for forecast informed reservoir operations. So basically what we're trying to do with the scenario is can we increase water storage on the Russian River side of things and or reduced water needs on the Russian River side of things to compensate for potential reductions in water coming over for the Eel River Basin? Is there a sweet spot that we can make both of those magical things happen? So what Firo is, is we have an existing dam on Lake Mendocino um, that stores, I think, 111,000 acre feet of water. That The purpose of that dam, one of the purposes of it is to provide flood control releases. The Corps of Engineer owns it and manages it in the wintertime. And they, they empty parts of the reservoir to maintain space for flood control. So if you get a big storm event coming, and so that drains part of the reservoir, can we keep that reservoir higher storage with some of the new tools that we have on runoff predictions. So when they built the dam back in 1955, you know, we were on slide rules. Now we have satellites and all sorts of fancy sophisticated uh, modeling efforts. So we can actually do better reservoir operations to allow us to keep more water in the reservoir in the winter time. And then the other thing is to reduce water demand on the Russian River Basin by, by having a different release um, requirement coming out of Lake Mendocino that's actually better for fish that lowers um, summer flows. So based on improved information on what fish need in the Russian River Basin, we can lower flows in the winter, or in the summer, I'm sorry, to reduce the demand of releases throughout the summer in Lake Mendocino. So both of these things help the Russian River side. But then what's the run, run of the river diversion on the Eel River side? So run of the river is a bad term. Um, so I'll explain that now. So what is right run of the river? That's kind of the framework of the scenario. So as you all know, in the wintertime on the Eel River Basin, we get lots of rain, we get some big floods. And what Lake Pillsbury did historically was we would catch that water and store it in the wintertime and spring and then release it in the summer for diversion into the Russian River. So what we would do now is flip that on its head by taking out Scott Dam and Lake Pillsbury. So we lose this storage in Lake Pillsbury 
So we have no storage on the Eel River Basin, but what we would do is we would maintain a diversion facility at Van Arsdale, and we would divert water in the winter in spring, in early spring, when there's lots of water in the Eel River system. So we'd be diverting quote unquote excess water into the Russian River Basin through the tunnel. And now we just need a place to put that water. And that's where Lake Mendocino is important. We could increase, we could raise like make the Coyote Valley Dam height. But what we analyzed was allowing more storage in the existing reservoir with flood informed reservoir operations, and then reducing the demand of releases out of Lake Mendocino in the summer. So that's kind of the sweet spot that we were looking at. But one of the things Lake Mendocino provides the storage, but Potter Valley Irrigation District is in between those two places. So for this to work, we would actually have to pump water back uphill into Potter Valley to make Potter Valley Irrigation District whole. And that's a very expensive endeavor. So that's um, what we're kind of looking at is, are there other ways that we can do this, like putting, putting surface flows in the winter into groundwater in Potter Valley and then pumping that out in the summer? for example, so or putting small reservoirs in Potter Valley to store some of that water for release in the summer so we don't have to do this pump back. So that's kind of what scenario two is all about. And the modeling that we did suggested that, wow, this could actually work. And so it gave people a lot of excitement um, that maybe there is a two basin solution that could work from a water supply perspective. So we modeled this from um, using um, so these are model results, they're not measured results specifically from 1911 to 2017. So we had a long period of record. I just want to show you a couple things of what that would look like. Um, first of all, in the Eel River. So what would this look like below um, the Potter Valley project? Um, so a couple things here. You don't have to squint at all the, the drawings here, but this is time on the x-axis down here. So October through September. And then this is flows, so this is 100 cubic feet per second, 1,000. And a couple of the things with Scott Dam gone, one of the things that would happen is that we, instead of Scott Dam's trapping the first fall flows, we call them fall freshets, those would be unimpaired. So those would pass downstream, and that would help fall run Chinook migrate into the upper basin. And then once flows got high enough in the, in the system, then we would start diverting water into the Russian River Basin. And you can see here that we would be peeling off about 300 CFS when there's a lot of water in the Eel River Basin throughout the winter and into the spring. And then at some point, we would turn off the diversion, and then the Eel River would go back to an unimpaired flow condition in the spring. And one of the interesting things is um, the reservoir used to release in most years more water into the Eel River than unimpaired. So an un un unimpaired condition flows in the Eel would actually be lower in most years in the summer. So flows would, would be much lower, potentially down to three or four CFS cubic feet per second compared to you know 20 to 30 CFS um, in a year like this. So um, so really, again, the, the main thing is here is pull water off the Eel River when the impacts of that are minor in the winter and spring, and then stop diverting in the late spring and summer and fall when the Eel River needs that water the most. This is a graph showing the diversions at Van Arsdale that diverts water into the Russian River. So the blue line here is kind of the existing conditions, and the red line is what scenario two would look like. And you can see that we would be um, diverting much more water, higher magnitude and longer duration in the winter. And then we would stop diverting in the late spring and through the early summer compared to you know, diversions throughout the summer under current conditions here. So we'd be shifting the timing of those diversions. So these um, existing diversions here for Potter Valley Irrigation District, you know, they would depend on this water for irrigation. That water is not going to be there anymore with this solution. So again, we need to come up with some solution for Potter Valley Irrigation District, either pumping water back from Lake Mendocino or some other local water source. And then this shows what Mendocino storage looks like. So for the Russian Riverside, maintaining storage in Lake Mendocino is very important. Again, October through September. And these lines, and this is storage in acre feet. And this line here is what the core imposes for storage limits on the reservoir for flood control. So the total capacity of the reservoir is about 111,000 acre feet. They lower the reservoir down in the wintertime down to about 70,000 acre feet for flood control. 
And that limits how much water they carry over through the spring and summer. And you can see under existing conditions, because of that rule, they don't fill the reservoir. So right there, they've lost 10,000 acre feet of water because of this flood control rule, rule curve here. With Firo, they can increase the storage in the wintertime up to here. And so they keep the reservoirs higher, shown by the red line here. And these are spill events over the reservoir or high flow releases for the reservoir. And then, then they fully fill the reservoir. And so you can see that there's way more water stored in Lake Mendocino but then there's not as much water coming over from Potter Valley anymore because we've cut off the diversions. So the recession limb is steep on storage, but it would be even steeper um, if we didn't have the reduced release requirements from Lake Mendocino. So the combination of all these pieces do with our modeling shows that this could work um, for the Russian Riverside. So again, that was pretty exciting. So a lot of bullets here, but just kind of a summary of results. We um, The net results is summer base flows on the Eel River would decrease in most years about 20% because we don't have Scott Dam releases like artificially supporting releases on the Eel River. Um, we would get our fall flows back. Um, so those flows are higher because Scott Dam is no longer there trapping those fl um, flows. So that'll help Chinook salmon migration. There's virtually no change in the average water volume delivered to the Eel River Basin. Um, and there's a small increase in flow and total volume into the Russian River Basin because we're pushing more water in the wintertime. But the amount of usable water probably wouldn't change all that much to the Russian River Basin. A um, few other important things. Um, Potter Valley Irrigation District is going to be probably the, the hardest hit here because they have increased number of water shortfalls. Um, but they're really dependent on the, the water pumping water back um, from Lake Mendocino, um, which is again, really expensive. So we have some uncertainties here on the rules of when these diversions would end in the spring. And so we're starting to work on sharpening the pencil on this alternative now. That's something that we're just starting to work on. But again, this scenario here kind of gave us hope that maybe there is a solution here that we could work on. So a lot of hydrology to throw at you. Um, I'll stop here for some quick questions. I see there's a few in the chat. Yeah. What would a new diversion on Eel River look like? I will actually go into that in a second. That's uh, number three. And could you explain a little better, rather than pumping back out of Lake Mendocino, what could be done in the Potter Valley to store water? for them to have? Yeah, so we've looked at, in a very um, cursory way, we've looked at a, a large a variety of different options. So there's a bunch of um, small ponds that um, the a lot of the ag folks are using for frost protection, um, but they're pretty small. So we could say, we'll scale that up. And instead of having 50 ponds in Potter Valley, what if we had a thousand little ponds? that could be used to store water, like store water in the winter and then use it for agricultural use. Um, there's not a whole lot of space there and the space would be, would take away from agricultural land use. Um, so that wasn't, that didn't really rank very high. Another one that I mentioned in passing is looking at the, um, at pushing water into the shallow groundwater table in the winter time for conjunctive use and then pumping that groundwater out in the um, summer. So that's being evaluated right now as part of kind of a next phase of feasibility studies. But our hypothesis is that the depth of that groundwater table is pretty shallow. And so the volume of water there is not very much. So that's, um, I don't think we have a whole lot of hope for that, but we're just confirming it. So there's some geotechnical analysis being underway to kind of confirm how much water storage potential there is in Potter Valley. And then the other one that we're looking at in more detail, um, not we, but the feasibility study engineers um, are looking at off-channel storage with building additional dams on smaller tributaries in Potter Valley um, that can that we can divert water from the Eel River Basin into those tributaries as well as catching the, the local runoff. So there's um, Boys Creek and Bush Creek are kind of the two larger watersheds in Potter Valley. And we can get, you know, seven to 9,000 acre feet of storage out of those. Um, but to get that kind of storage, you're building a 100 plus foot dam on each of those. So it's like, okay, now we're building more dams that are like have hazards associated with them if they fail. 
Um, so there's issues with that. So there's kind of a trade-offs analysis that's going to need to occur on those water supply options for the on the Potter Valley side. What is the danger of faults and earthquakes in that whole area? Well, there's, they're pretty high. The study that PG&E kind of updated um, the technology of assessing earthquake risk. Well, first of all, I'm not an expert at this. And so it's based on um, the recent work that PG&E has filed with, with Federal Agency, Energy Regulatory Commission is that when they did their earthquake analysis back in the early 2000s, they've kind of redone um, the ground acceleration risk at the dam itself. And they found that the, that the um, acceleration for the design earthquake of record, which is like a 900 year event, is increased by 60% compared to what they were cal calculating back in the early 2000s. So that risk is substantially increased. I mean, the real risk hasn't really changed, but their computation of the risk has increased substantially. And that's the reason that they leave the gates open now and store less water because with a full reservoir, the risk of downstream damage and dam failure is much higher with a full reservoir compared to a partially empty reservoir. So if they put 100 foot reservoirs on these tributaries, would that just be a same problem? Well, they'd be engineered to handle that now. Um, keep in mind that Scott Dam was built in 1920 to 1922. So the technology back then is not nearly as good as it is now. So any new dams would be designed to, um, to be able to withstand that earthquake, uh, the design earthquake. That's kind of our assumption. But those are extremely expensive dams to build if they're over 100 feet tall. Any other questions, Jane? Who would pay for dam construction if that had to be done? Well, that's a good question. Um, the water district? Well, there would be a new entity formed when the Two Basin Solution Group um, was investigating this. One of the things that they would have needed to do is to form a new entity and develop a, a financing plan um, to pay for all this. And so we did cost estimates as part of the feasibility studies. but. Um, but when they pulled the plug on not pursuing the license, they meaning the planning agreement partners, the effort to, to develop a new entity also stopped. So that's a major question. Somebody would have to pay for that. So it could be a new entity that comes in that provides that capital, um, or it could be depending on who owns it, there could be some you know, public funds that could be used as well. But there's kind of like two main components. One is the capital, which is you know probably in the hundreds of millions of dollars for decommissioning and rebuilding the facilities. And then there's the O and M, the operations and maintenance, which is a substantial increase as well. So part of the financing would have to be, and the O and M funding would have to be monetizing the water um, diversions, in addition to potentially keeping to generate power um, that would help offset the cost. It wouldn't pay for the project, but it would still generate some income as part of an overall portfolio, but the water monet monetization would provide most of the funding for o and So the water recipients in Potter Valley have to pay for the water they get, and do they pay the actual, anywhere near the cost of providing that water? Not currently, not at $16 an acre foot, or you know, it's somewhere in there, 16 to $17 an acre foot. So then the cost of that water would have to increase substantially, just even for the O&M costs, let alone the capital costs, you know, that, so that, that was kind of a whole nother reason why this didn't really go any further with the part, the two basin partners because of the large costs associated with this. What happened to that? Why did they pull the plug? Um, largely just because of costs. Um, they're just very high and um, you know there's again capital costs for taking the dam out and um, you know there's uncertainty about who would pay for like the capital costs because theoretically PG&E could should could or should be paying for some of those capital costs for decommissioning um, so it was I think mostly financial. So who's going to pay to take it down now? Um, PG&E will be. Um, they're on the hook. Okay. Yeah, they're responsible for it. And so they've been, they have a fund that they've been collecting um, internally for decommissioning. Great. Thank you very much.
All right. So let's talk about, let's just say that there was a two basin solution. So there was some entity that took over a part of this project to continue diverting water into the Russian River Basin in a way that um, maintains and improves ecological conditions on the Eel River Basin and maintains water supply to the Russian River Basin. How could we do that? There's a couple, there's a lot of things that we would need to look at. And this is just a short list here. But water supply impacts that we've talked about before, including reliability and timing. And keep in mind, too, that this two basin solution, a foundational assumption on this is Scott Dam is removed. And all the sediment that's behind Scott Dam, plus the, the natural sediment that it's been trapping for 100 years, would now be running through our project area and through our diversion, including large wood and, and other debris. So like the whole landscape is going to change with Scott Dam removing, being removed. And so we have to worry about water supply reliability under this Scott Dam removal scenario. We also have to worry about fish passage into the upper watershed, um, particularly at Cape Horn Dam. Shouldn't be an issue at Scott Dam because the dam is going to be removed. But how are we going to remove managed sediment? We have to restore the river um, underneath Lake Pillsbury with Scott Dam and Lake Pillsbury gone. How are we going to route sediment downstream of Scott Dam? What are the impacts of that going to be to the diversion, as well as water supply for people diverting water out of the Eel River Basin, as well as water um, intake facilities at Rio Dell and on the lower Eel River? So those are concerns that people have. Fire suppression, um, because Lake Pillsbury is important for water supply for fire suppression. Um, and then there's fish habitat impacts, short-term and long-term, from the decommissioning, so largely sediment, changes in the channel downstream, um, impacts to fishery, and I'll show that some of those impacts in a minute. But the other thing is that we want overall fishery restoration in the Eel River watershed, meaningful fishery restoration to support our um, communities, both tribal and commercial and recreational fisheries, um, and just the intrinsic value of the Eel River watershed. So there's gonna be short, short term and long term impacts from decommissioning, but we want an overall sig significant net benefit from this. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on the fish passage at Cape Horn Dam and then sediment management, if we still have time. Um, I can always bail on the sediment management part. But again, as a geomorphologist, this is really interesting for me. We do have time. Just go ahead. You've got 45 minutes. OK. All right. So I think, yeah, I think we are doing pretty good. So what I'll talk about from here are based on two studies. Um, that were done in July, and actually these were these are actually November 2021. These are drafts here. Um, Scott Dam and Cape Horn Dam removal alternatives uh, prepared by McMillan Jacobs. They're just now McMillan, um, but pre prepared for the two basin solution partners. Both of these were. And one looked at Scott and Cape Horn Dam removal, and the other looked at um, fish passage improvement at Cape Horn Dam. So it kind of focused on this. There's a lot of overlap between these two reports. And I gave you at the beginning of the presentation links to where you can find these. So if you're interested in more detail, you can look at these reports. Okay, so what are some of the problems with Cape Horn Dam from a water supply reliability perspective? Again, with Scott Dam removal, we have fish screens to prevent fish from getting trapped and um, diverted into the Russian River Basin. So how are fish screens gonna work with increased sediment and debris loading? We could have a lot of sediment deposition in the four bay. So the four bay is basically just the little reservoir, Van Arsdale Reservoir. So what if your diversion impact just got buried in sediment um, and then the whole diversion would get shut down? Um, large wood deposition in that diversion facility. Um, we're gonna have much higher turbidity. So do we wanna be sending a lot of sediment laden water over into the Russian River Basin? So there's a lot of issues with, with water supply reliability that um, people in the Russian River Basin are concerned with. But from the, from the fishery perspective, we also want to make sure that we have unimpeded uh, volitional fish passage upstream as well as downstream. So juvenile fish passage downstream as well as um, uh, spawned steelhead that can survive another trip out to the ocean. They're, they're called kelts. So we don't want those fish bouncing across the face of the dam. We want them to survive and come back again as adults. We have to worry about how do we route sediment through Cape Horn Dam? How do we route large wood through there? How do we provide structural stability of that diversion infrastructure? Again, getting at the water supply reliability. And then there's a lot of regulatory and tribal policy and regulatory requirements. And from our, our client, one of their policies is 
they want to restore free flowing Eel River. So we need to kind of define what that is and try to achieve that if we can. So the phase two feasibility studies, we looked at a lot of these things. I just had the, a couple of them on the previous screen. And right now there's a new feasibility that study that was building on these that was funded by DWR that will continue to refine these things. So the way that we've approached this over time is we've brainstormed a wide range of, of potential solutions and now we're focusing as we learn more and go, well, these aren't very feasible, but these show promise. And so then, now we're spending more effort on trying to, to refine these and develop potential designs for those as well. So I wanted just to kind of go over um, how do, would we mo potentially modify Cape Horn Dam for fish passage and water supply reliability? So there's four options that we looked at. One is to keep Cape Horn Dam in place as is for the most part and improve the existing fish ladder in the dam to improve um, fish passage. Option two is to take out most of Cape Horn Dam and then pump water into over to the Russian River through the existing diversion facility. So that's a pumping option that removes most of Cape Horn Dam. There's another option that we use gravity um, that we remove part of Cape Horn Dam and still use gravity to push water over into the existing into the Russian River at the existing location. And then another one is to use gravity, but we have a new diversion facility upstream of Van Arsdale Diversion. So you can imagine that gravity is free, doesn't take power to, you know, gravity does the work for us and pushing water over into the Russian River Basin, whereas pumping water takes a lot of power and new infrastructure. So there's a whole lot of trade-offs and feasibility issues associated with each one. So what do those look like? So option one is to keep Cape Horn Dam in. And what we would do, this is, this is an aerial view here. This shows the fish ladder. So it flows from the bottom to the top. So this is Cape Horn Dam here. And then this is a little grade control structure. And we call this a fish hotel. Adult fish migrate up into this fish hotel. It's like a concrete bunker. And the fish ladder wraps around, comes up and over the dam, and then they can swim up Van Arsdale Reservoir into the upper basin. So again, Scott Dam would be removed. So once they got over this, they'd be able to mi freely migrate into the entirety of the upper basin. So we'd keep Cape Horn Dam here. We would address some fish passage issues with the existing ladder, deal with sediment deposition issues. There may be a different alignment of a new fish ladder over here. And then for downstream passage, um, we would have you know, instead of having fish bounce down the spillway, we would have kind of a sluice way for fish and sediment to safely get over the dam, juveniles and adults, to get downstream so they can route out to the, to the ocean. And we would keep the existing intake structure. So this is the intake structure here and a pipeline that goes through the mountain over to the Russian River. This would stay largely the same. Um, and we just kind of leave it as is. So this is obviously probably the cheapest version. Mm -hmm. So again, that's option one, least amount of effort. So diversion, option two is to remove almost all of the dam here, remove almost all of the secondary structure. These would be one foot tall, so fish can get over it. We would remove all of the fish ladder and the fish hotel, and we would put in a wall here between the diversion facility and the edge of the old dam to isolate the river, and this would be the new Eel River would be on the inside, and we'd fill all this in, the old reservoir, and then we would put in a new pumping station here that has fish screens on it. And this pumping station is 43 feet lower than the dam crest. So this dam here um, is, again, is about 65 feet total drop, about 45 feet of water surface drop. Fish would be able to freely route, migrate through this area here because this would be gone. We'd have a pump station down here, potentially in harm's way, but we'd have some sort of giant wall here to protect the pumping facility. And this would be a pipeline that would pump water into the existing tunnel over here. So that's how that would work. So that's option two. So we'd have to have a lot more power needs to make this happen, but our fish passage would be better because most of the dam is, is pulled out and sediment routing would be a lot better too. So sediment would just route on the inside of the meander bend here. Option three is to remove most of the dam. It's much less of the dam 
but we'd have to create a new diversion weir here. So it could be boulder weir right here. We would lower this about 20 feet lower than the top of this dam. And then, so there'd be a 20 foot drop between this location here and down here below the existing dam. And so that 20 feet drop would, or 25 foot drop would have to get redistributed. We'd like stretch that elevation drop instead of it being a vertical wall or near vertical wall with Cape Horn Dam there, we would stretch it out over a longer distance to reduce the slope. So instead of a vertical wall, that slope would be about 3.1%. And we would develop a, what we call a roughened channel through here. And the alignment could be in different places, but we would go all the way down through here at 3.1%. We would fill all this. The dam would be removed. And fish and sediment would be routed through this new channel here. And by lowering this 20 feet, that's still high enough to have gravity push water into this diversion facility. So no power need with this option here. Yeah. So what is a roughen channel? So this is a couple of examples of roughen channels. So basically what you need to do with a very steep channel, you would have to make the grain size and the banks very coarse to absorb that energy. So the steeper the slope of the channel, the more velocities, the more energy during flood events. So here's an example on Rocky Gulch where we replaced a culvert, um, vertical drop on a culvert, and you can see that we just use very coarse material. Here's another example on the tributary of the Rogue River. So you can see we add lots of large boulders here. We would need to upscale this substantially for the Eel River because it's a much larger river than this um, example here. So that's a major uncertainty for use in a river like this where we have tens of thousands of cubic feet per second coming through here at peak flows. We're gonna have to have like house size and smaller boulders in here to keep this stable. So that's kind of an engineering um, assessment that we're gonna need to assess as part of this new DWR grant that we're working on now. And then the last option, um, this kind of zooms out a little bit on the air photo. So here's Cape Horn Dam here. Um, and then here's the diversion facility. It's like, let's just remove this in entirety, but can we put a new diversion facility up here and still use gravity to push water into the existing diversion. So what we would do is create a new smaller facility here that's got a new bladder weir. So it's something that works on compressed air that will like lift up a weir when we want to um, raise the water surface elevation and have gravity feed into this canal. We would have a fish screen here and we'd screen out all the juvenile fish and return them back to the river. And then this would be kind of a free flowing river from here on out. So this would be good fish passage through here, but we'd have to build a whole new canal through this, which is private property. And we'd probably need to have another fish ladder here and we'd have be building a, basically a new dam that would have to be operational in the winter and spring because that's when we want to divert water under this water supply scenario too. So we don't think this is very feasible because it's like, well, we're just moving the dam upstream. This is gonna be really expensive. We have to build another fish ladder. So this may not make it too much further than that, but that's kind of the other option that we're looking at. So again, we're just starting on kind of sharpening our pencil on these options. Sonoma Water is taking the lead on this via a grant from the California Department of Water Resources. And we're gonna do more thorough trade-offs analysis and brainstorming to inform a potential preferred solution and kind of start the design process for that preferred um, solution. So kind of another good stopping point for any questions. What is your role in all this? So I work for the Round Valley Indian Tribes. They're a member of the Two Basin Solution Partners. So they're like a full member. And their policy right now is to try to find a solution that'll work for both basins. Obviously, their focus is improving the e ecological health and fisheries health on the Eel River Basin. So that's a priority. But they're also, their current policy is to try to find a, a solution that works for both basins. So they're a signatory to the two basin solution. So um, part of my job is to work with the two basin partners as a technical support um, to help on brainstorming analysis. We spend probably more time on evaluating the fish trade, fish habitat and productivity trade-offs 
for these, but we also provide input um, on some of the engineering solutions. So we've done a lot of work on sediment management that I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but then what are we gonna get from a fisheries perspective with these different options? And then also looking at flow management, um, both kind of on an interim basis, uh, prior to decommissioning happening, and then after decommissioning, how do we operate these facilities um, from a flow perspective? So that's kind of what we're focusing our effort on, but it's a collaborative process that we're engaged in. Good question. Uh, you have a question, please address low flows in the summer eel and algae bloom. Yeah, so that's a that's a good issue that, um, and there's toxicity issues with um, a lot of these algae blooms. So that's something that would likely be exacerbated under a decommissioning scenario because summer low flows are going to be even lower. But one of the trade-offs is that winter flows and particularly spring flows will probably be higher. So there may be some changes in timing of algal blooms. But again, summer low flows will probably be lower under a decommissioning um, situation because they'll be unimpaired, uh, particularly in drier years. And we won't have the, the dam to artificially release higher summer base flows. So and that's how it, still going to be there. Yeah. How would a change in the lower river flow pattern affect squawfish, squawfish control efforts? Probably not too much. Um, there's a squaw or a, yeah, pike minnow um, eradication program that PG&E is required to do as part of their license in the upper basin. Um, one of the potential then there's um, pike minnow up. So pike minnow, or I guess a PC term for squawfish. Um, there's um, pike minnow upstream of the dam. There's a lot of pike minnow in the reservoir itself. So one of the, so there's always going to be a source population. So removing the dam could reduce the source population because um, they do pretty well in lakes. But there's some other feasibility type of analyses that are looking at, um, and actually some pilot projects underway right now in the South Fork Eel for um, for reducing uh, pike minnow population. So there's a weir that just got installed a few weeks ago on the South Fork Eel by UC Berkeley and Caltrout and um, uh, we out tribe. Um, so we'll learn a lot there. There's some genetic approaches that um, Cal Poly Humboldt's going to be looking at to kind of see if there's a way that we can reduce their, their um, reproduction rates uh, for from genetics perspective. Um, and then just mechanical removal, which is currently what's going on in the upper basin. But it's not going to solve that problem alone. And then the question is, what is Covella's connection to this? Um, what was, what connection? It's spelled C-O-V-E-L-O-S. Steve, do you want to explain that? Are you here? Maybe he's referring to Covalo. Yeah, if it's, if it's Covalo, that's, I'm assuming it's just Round Valley Indian tribes. Um, so again, they're very engaged in this. Um, so they also have a, um, a, a role in the annual operations of the project because um, as part of the existing PG&E license, um, agencies are required to consult on a variety of issues, including um, 2,500 acre feet of block water releases each year. And so the agencies, meaning NIMS, US Fish and Wildlife Service, California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Round Valley Tribes are the agencies. We have to do annual management of flows from 2,500 acre feet. And then we have to sign off on report reviews as well as um, any kind of variances to their FERC license. Um, so that we're very engaged in that from an annual perspective. I probably spend 30 to 40% of my time on that kind of stuff. So it's very substantial. Wow. And then how much knowledge will the two basin solution learn from the Klamath dams being removed? Um, quite a bit, and I'll talk about, so I, there's a lot from the climate dams, but I think there's also a lot from other um, decommissioning projects, particularly Elwha and a few of the others. So we've done some field tours to help educate the two basin partners on, um, on not only uh, dam removal, but also um, for fish passage um, options as well. So we're always striving to, you know, not reinvent the wheel on these sorts of things. So climate dam removal is going to be very important. But the Klamath system and the Eel River system are very different beasts. And I'll show you an example of that in just a second. 
The final question, is there any feasibility for removing sediment before removal of dams to help ease the problems associated with sed sediment transfer into the Russian River Basin in Mendocino and elsewhere? That's a great lead in question. So I'll talk about that now. Um, okay. I did not plant that question, I swear. <laughs> All right. So how much sediment is in Lake Pillsbury? So this dam has been here for 100 years. The Eel River Basin, I'm sure some of you have heard, that has got some of the highest erosion sedimentation rates of any watershed in the world. It's um, huge sediment yield. Um, and we've had 100 years for that sediment to accumulate. So this is an aerial photo in 2014 with the reservoir pulled down pretty low during the 2014-15 drought. And what this shows is the delta of the main stem Eel River coming into Lake Pillsbury. And then there's another major fork around the corner here called the Rice Fork. And um, we've done, not we, but PG&E has done bathymetric surveys here. And there's about 21 million cubic yards of sediment that, that are stored in this reservoir. And of that 21 million cubic yards of sediment, most of that is fine sediment. Um, typically the rule of thumb is like five to 10% of the sediment is coarse. So 90 to 95% of that sediment is fine. And when I say fine sediment, I'm talking about sands and silts. So stuff that's easily mobilized and transported downstream. So how, what is 21 million cubic yards? It sounds like a big number and it is a big number. So if you, Went down to Santa Clara and looked at the football field at the 49ers stadium here. So 120 yards long and 50 something yards wide. If you piled all that stuff on top of a football field, that would be 10,000 feet of sediment. So nearly two miles deep of sediment that's stored in this reservoir. So it's like, holy cow, what are we gonna do with this? Um, so that's a huge question for us because there's substantial potential impacts. So what we did for a project in 2018 and 19 with Caltrout is we started looking at like different options for this. And we looked at a wide range of dam removal projects throughout the Western, actually throughout the country. And one of the, and so there's a different analogs or um, um, I guess comparative case studies that we can look at and Klamath would be one once that's um, done. But one of the best ones is on Elwha River, particularly Lake Mills, because their, their uh, dam removal process was very similar. So this, again, is that same aerial photog photograph showing the delta here. And one of the interesting things is, um, is the confinement of the river in the reservoir once the dam is removed. There's a bunch of different ways that sediment could be moved based on the morphology, the, the valley width, um, and slope of the of the river and the valley when the dam is removed. And um, there could be a canyon there, like on Condit Dam on um, up in Oregon. So we went and looked through all these and looked for kind of the best analogs. And the best one is on Lake Mills on the Elwha River. And what you see here is once the dam comes out, the channel migrates through the delta. And you can, and as it does that, it's you know obviously very steep right where the dam was and what there's a process called head cutting or channel incision that elevation drop quickly erodes into the delta sediments upstream and then the channel starts moving back and forth within those sediments and you can see that as it migrates it leaves some of the sediments high and dry but then other sediment you know it's cutting down actively cutting down as it as the channel readjusts what the river is always trying to do is it's trying to find what's called the equilibrium gradient. So if you looked at the profile of the river longitudinally from top to bottom, if there's a discontinuity in the river like that, if you take a dam out, it's always trying to smooth that discontinuity out to reach some new equilibrium. And that's what we see here on Elwha is the river is cutting a new channel through that. And you can see that happening when the reservoir is low on Lake Pillsbury. So we did, we took this process and we made some estimates out of the two, 21 million cubic yards of sediment that's here, there's gonna be a lot of it that's gonna be stored up here in what we call terraces that isn't gonna be transported downstream. And we estimated that out of that 21 million cubic yards, probably about 12 million of it could, would be eroded and transported downstream. And most of that sediment's gonna be fine sand and silts. So I don't know, roughly about half of it we think would stay in storage up here, and then the other half would be transported downstream. 
So instead of two miles of of sediment depth on your 49ers uh, football field, it would only be roughly one mile moving downstream. And so we looked at a bunch of different options of like, well, can we excavate this material and store it someplace so that it doesn't go downstream? And so I don't have the details to share with you today, but we came up with a the most cost-effective way is to take the dam out in stages and treat the dam as a sedimentation basin let the river erode this material and deposit it down here by the dam and then pump it as a slurry out of this big flat area over here and just create these big terraces up in here. So we could actually pump that fine sediment up here and remove you know, 12 million cubic yards. But the cost of that is, is still huge, but it's a lot cheaper to, to do it that way as a pumping process rather than taking excavators down in here and man manually removing it. But that cost is probably in the 40 to $50 million to do that. So that's one option of doing it. Another option is just pull that, you know, pull the Band-Aid off quickly and just send a pulse of that sediment down. Um, we found that it, it typically cuts down, this cutting down process happens pretty quickly. You know, you may get 80 or 90% of that sediment, you know, getting mobilized in the first you know, weeks to month, depending on the morphology of the valley. But just get the pain over with. You're going to kill a lot of things, but just get it over with quickly and save yourself 40 or $50 million. So, but that's one of the questions of like, do we remove some of it, all of it, let it pass? We need to look at what the potential channel impacts are going to be. Is it going to fill in the channel downstream of Scott Dam? Is it going to bury people's, you know, bridges, houses? impact water supply downstream on the Eel River? What are the fishery impacts? It's going to have substantial damage, short-term damage to habitat downstream, but there's going to be long-term benefits um, both to habitat downstream and accessibility to habitat upstream. So all those trade-offs are really hard for us to work through, and you got to put it on some ledger and make some decisions based on those trade-offs. So let's just take a look at an example of some of those trade-offs. So let's look at suspended sediment. So again, we're focusing on fine sediment, sands and silts. And during high flows, those sands and silts get suspended into the water column, and that's what gives you the chocolate milk. This is Cape Horn Dam um, at, I think, is about 15,000 cubic feet per second. So you can see it gets huge down here, and you can see it's chocolate milk. So these concentrations here, are probably in the five to 10,000 milligrams per liter of suspended sediment concentration. So it's very turbid, very dirty water. We did some modeling, or our team did some modeling um, to look at trade-offs between you know, a, a phased dam removal versus you know, pull the band-aid off quick and get over with fast. And we the trade-offs there is the faster the dam decommissioning, the higher the sediment concentrations are going to be but the lower duration of those high suspended sediments. So that's what you're kind of doing the trade-off. And when we did this modeling and predicting, um, we're getting very, very high concentrations of suspended sediment, like hundreds of thousands of milligrams per liter, which are like off the chart of what we would see under natural conditions. So it's almost like a slurry. And when we look at those, um, over that range of, you know, a slower dam removal process versus a faster dam removal process. So lower flows, but much, you know, lower concentrations of suspended sediment, but much longer durations. So like 200 hours versus 19 hours. When we go through our biological models for, you know, the slow version, we're looking at 80 to, or 60 to 80% mortality of, of fish. And it's a little bit lower mortality for the shorter duration, but substantial predicted impact to the fishery. So we're going to have to find ways to mitigate these impacts. And those could be off-channel rearing um, solutions, but it's going to be a substantial impact that we're going to have to analyze. So this is kind of like the next step of where we're at is like, how can we do this? And this is, again, where Klamath is going to be really helpful for us to inform us on how to manage for this. So those are some pretty scary numbers. Does it matter what time of year that you turn the water loose? <laughs> well, first of all, we're gonna have to rely on for high, if we want high flows to move sediment, we're gonna have to do the decommit, the dam 
removal in the winter time because you know in the summertime flows can be you know three to twenty cfs. So those low flows don't have any real ability to move that sediment. So when we look at these flows of well if flows are a thousand cfs, do we take our dynamite and blow up the dam or two thousand cfs or five thousand cfs? So that's kind of what these options are looking at. So if we if we um, light the dynamite fuse when when inflows are 5,000 CFS, we would use those natural flows as the mechanism to move that sediment. So the timing of it is really important. And they've done this on some of the other dam removal projects. They've timed the demolition of the dam to coincide with a certain high flow event to so that Mother Nature can do most of the work on the and get it over with quickly. Who makes the final decision on the design? Well, um, PG&E will make a decommissioning plan and submit that to FERC, uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. There will be a consultation process with the uh, tribes and regulatory agencies, and there will be a public comment period. So there'll be a lot of interaction to comment on PG&E's proposed plan. And ultimately, there will have to be con some sort of concurrence from regulatory agencies um, to sign off on this plan and sign off on the decommissioning plan. Ultimately, it'll be FERC's decision, um, but it'll be with consultation and compliance with a lot of different um, regulatory requirements. So that's kind of a long-winded answer that FERC will make the final decision on that as the action agency. Um, but there'll be lots of opportunities for input. So really what this kind of gets into the next steps is that we're trying to provide as much information to inform the decommissioning plan as soon as we possibly can so that we have a better plan when it hits the street. How many CFFs, CFSs have summer base flows average generally? I would say that probably it depends on the type of water year. So like this year is going to be much higher, but I think in kind of the normal and wetter years, it's probably like 10 cubic feet per second, 10 to 15 under unimpaired. Um, and we've installed gauging stations upstream of the reservoir to answer that very question. Um, because, you know, there's a misperception that um, it's going to be nirvana once the dam comes out and we're going to have all this water in the river. Um, and we wanted to better understand what those flows are. Um, so, you know, worst case scenario, we've had dry, very dry years in 2020, 21, and flows were getting down. Total flows are getting down into three to four CFS range. So that's kind of like worst case scenario in the summertime. There may be a little bit more accretion. So this is like just on the upstream edge of the reservoir. So we might get another CFS through the, um, the reservoir bottomlands, but it's not gonna be too much. But when in the the silt winter silt time, it's gonna be much higher. Yeah, thank you. When the silt reaches the ocean, what impacts would you expect there? Well, probably not too much um, because when we look at these volumes of, you know, 12 million cubic yards of sediment, of fine sediment, that's still a pretty small number compared to the literal drift of sediment off the coast. Um, but it's a significant issue, and it was a big issue for the Klamath Dam removal um, project for, you know, like harbor entrance um, concerns at um, on Crescent City, et cetera. Um, I think another concern um, that I mentioned briefly earlier is, is downstream impacts to water intakes, both for you know, individual water rights holders along the Eel River, but also um, potential impacts for um, downstream communities um, to get their water from the Eel River Basin. So, um, and there's been some analyses and observations of, of impacts on the Elwha River again. Um, it's a little bit different because Elwha was only, I think, four and a half miles upstream from the ocean where we're 150 miles. Um, so a lot of the impacts of the sediment will be um, diluted by the time you get down downstream closer to the ocean. But that's a question that's kind of on our list. Um, we just kind of haven't really gotten there yet in any great detail. You've got a lot on your list. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, um, and we can ask a few more questions. This this is kind of the last slide here is like, where are we at now and what are the next steps? Um, and so this has kind of been updated 
two hours ago from our conversation with PG&E, and none of this is confidential, so um, that was my first question to them. Um, so they're actively working on a preliminary administrative draft um, license surrender and decommissioning plan um, that they want to um, distribute to agencies, tribes, and probably to the public in November 2023. And um, so they're working on that right now. They are, their current plan, um, the default decommissioning plan that they've verbally given us is that all facilities that touch the Eel River water will be removed and that the diversion will be sealed up forevermore. So that's like the baseline condition for their decommissioning plan. And they've left it open that if somebody steps up and wants to come up with an alternative decommissioning plan, like keeping Cape Horn Dam or modifying Cape Horn Dam and keeping the diversion, that they would entertain that um, proposal by somebody that as long as it was feasible, there was they had financial stability, they could they were it was feasible for them to implement it. So they would consider it, they're open to it. But the timeline for submitting that proposal is very short. So um, after November 23, 2023, they will no longer entertain offers to take over some or parts of the project. So that's again why um, there's a lot of urgency right now to inform us as fast as we possibly can um, for somebody like one or more members of the two basin partners that may want to submit a proposal to to implement one of the things that I showed you earlier, like with Cape Horn Dam modification. So we've got a lot on our plate. Um, and then there's another intermediate draft um, decommissioning plan submission, but then they're going to submit their final license surrender decommissioning plan to FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, in January 2025. So that's a statutory requirement. So there's no sliding on that schedule. Um, so things are moving pretty fast. And PG&E, because they're losing so much money on this project, they want to get this thing out and off their books as fast as possible. So their ideal is to begin the decommissioning process in 2028, which is surprising and probably unrealistic. Um, so it'll probably be a little bit later than that, but PG&E is highly motivated to get this done. So, which is exciting, but it's also scary. And they're dependent on FERC to, to make this happen as well. So I mentioned, you know, kind of in, parcel, in parallel with what PG&E is working on, um, there's uh, NIMS is making recommendations to FERC and PG&E in this interim period between now and when decommissioning is finished is that we need interim protective measures to protect the fishery um, listed species um, on the Eel River. And so we're in negotiations, um, discussions to um, refine those interprotective measures. And that would include flow regimes, monitoring, um, different operations, um, and some other measures um, on the Eel River and, and actually Russian River Basin too. So there's some uncertainty there, but um, you know, if it takes you know, up to five to 10 years for decommissioning to occur, we want to have something in place um, to provide regulatory compliance coverage and um, you know make things better during that period. And also, we've been in um, variances. Well, anyways, I don't go into that. It's a whole nother story. But the project isn't um, operating as it was intended to when they got their last license back in 2006. So we do variances on them almost every year now, which is a total nightmare to uh, <laughs> modify operations. Um, so we're doing a lot of data collection and studies um, to inform these things, um, gathering flow measurements, doing fish ha habitat and fish productivity modeling, um, in-stream flow studies, um, a lot of different things um, by ourselves and Sonoma Water and Two Basin Solution Partners. So we do a lot of trying, we're trying to coordinate all this information and not be redundant. Um, and do gaps or trying to figure out what PG&E is going to do versus what we need to do that PG&E won't do. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, we're looking at um, further feasibility studies with a new grant um, from Department of Water Resources. 
to try to continue to narrow down some feasible options. But again, can, given the, the timeline here of another owner, potential owner needs to have a, some sort of proposal submitted before November, 2023, we're trying to move fast on this to, to see if some of those, like those four scenarios that we showed earlier, if we can propose one of those and get a proposal moving forward there. You, I think you that's it. About another potential owner. Who would another potential owner be? I don't want to speculate on that because I don't want to put anyone on the spot. But um, as just as an example, um, there was the whole structure of the two basin solution partners was that that group um, or a subset of that group might form a new entity that would take that on. But um, we just don't know. And I don't, we work with all those folks. And so I don't want to like make some sort of assumption that one or more of them would create that kind of an entity. But that was just an example of something that was considered earlier. I don't know if that's still being considered or not. I can presume that PG&E would like to wash its hands of all this as soon as possible because they don't want to, if your option involves them staying engaged, they probably wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> no, no, this is like the, the Yugo that you've been trying to get rid of for years and years. And now there's a cash for clunkers program. And um, so they're trying to get rid of it. <laughs> Does anybody have any more questions? If so, say now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> and just a couple quick questions. I put them in the chat. Okay, what's the maximum CPS measured coming through Scott or Cape Horn? So um, Scott and Cape Horn Dam have spillways on them, so they can pretty much handle whatever nature throws at them. So what we often see is flows in the 10 to 20,000 CFS range for kind of like peak flows, um, but they're designed to take much higher flows. I forgot what the... Um, the maximum probable flood was, um, but it's, I think it's over 50,000 um, CFS, so they can handle a lot. Okay, let's see. How many CFS had summer base flows averaged generally? Did you already answer that? <laughs> yeah, on the Eel River, yes. Um, but again, it just kind of varies um, by different water year types. And the, um, the, the nice thing too is, um, if you went to the Two Basin Solution website, um, there's our water supply report is on that website. Um, and if you look in that report, there's a PowerPoint presentation there too. There's some really nice tables there that summarize um, the different flow volumes and diversions and reservoir storage data. So, and, it, and it's kind of a simple summary because there's like mountains of data there. So there's some, some numbers there that you can kind of see what, um, what those volumes would be. Um, and like I said, that's three or four years old now. And so we're working right now on like refining the rules associated with that scenario and kind of revisiting that. I think you already addressed this, but it says any plan for removing the accumulated silt in Pillsbury and basically digging out the channel to a point where millions of cubic yards of fines won't have to go through the system. Yeah, um, one thing I forgot to mention is that um, when we talk about future sediment, there's there's like two phases to it. One is associated with sediment that is liberated by, that has been stored in the reservoir. And that's a big number, you know, potentially 12 million cubic yards of sediment. But then once the dam, once we reach a new equilibrium condition, but then we also have all the upper watershed that's going to be contributing sediment too, which is way more than what we've been seeing over the last hundred years at Cape Horn Dam. So there's like kind of like two, two scales of increases in sediment. Um, so if we did sediment management up there, like remove sediment, it might help us, it would help us on that initial pulse of sediment once the dam comes out. There's still gonna be much, much higher um, amounts of sediment coming because we have the entire 350 miles of upper watershed that's now gonna be delivering its sediment to Cape Horn Dam and the diversion facility. And there's not much we can do about that. And that's where we need to choose our diversion facility very wisely so that it maintains water diversion reliability and water supply reliability 
in the face of both short-term and long-term increases in sediment supply from the upper watershed. One thing you haven't mentioned is how this is going to affect the fish in terms of giving them so much more Eel River to deal with. Yeah, and that's a good um, a good point. I mentioned it briefly. Um, so the main metric that we've been using so far is the number of miles that's um, newly accessible. Um, and I forgot some of the numbers, but like for steelhead, there's like another 350 longitudinal miles of habitat. And I think it's a little bit smaller for Chinook. Um, so there's going to be a lot more habitat that's available up there that's not impacted by the project. So it's, it's not pristine, but it's unimpaired. Um, there's a lot of fires up there. Um, and the habitat's pretty good up there. There's some partial barriers. Um, so there's physical habitat that's going to be um, made available. Um, and there's going to be some additional cold water habitat further up in the watershed. So there's some hope that we'll get um, summer run steelhead back up in there. This is the highest part of the watershed. You can see from the slide here is that this is where the majority of snow is, is in the upper watershed. So cold water sources um, will hopefully be better up here as fish get higher into the watershed. Um, so we're hoping for some substantial increases, but on the flip side too, it's, you know, it's a small part of the total watershed. So when we're looking at real meaningful improvements in fishery numbers like so we can not have our ocean closed down to salmon fishing and that we have you know we can harvest fish again it's going to take way more than just this project decommissioning to get there so i'm just trying to be honest and upfront that it's going to take a whole you know bigger picture perspective to get that type of objective so this is a small piece of it well and it's a very important piece and we really appreciate your doing this presentation, I have a lot better understanding of what on earth is going on. This is going to take a long time, uh, obviously, and you've been working on it for years, right? Yep, but not as long as some people, I think, on the call. So um, it's a pretty <laughs> exciting and it's a fast moving thing. So we're just like trying to stay ahead of the freight train and not get run over and provide as much information as possible to help us make good decisions. Let's see. Oh, there are two more messages. Whoops. One says, great presentation. You did a wonderful job of simplifying a complex problem. Uh, and then thanks for a lot of information for the, from the eel. And I want to thank you myself and everybody for coming <clears throat> and invite you to our final uh, brown bag lunch for the uh, spring session. It's on May 22nd, next Monday on USA Democracy, Where Are We Now with David Marshak. He's going to explore the health of democracy in the US today. It should be interesting. He's a really interesting guy. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Scott.